So, um, good morning again. And so, um, really, in the next few minutes, um, it'll be just an, uh, an overview of Eurodynamics. Um, and you heard from Thomas's uh, slides that you have actually there are two sets of tests in Eurodynamics. You have the non-invasive test, Euroflimetry, and the invasive test, the filling systometry and the pressure flow study. But quickly, I'll take you through some more provocative and challenging areas. One is, what is the information that Eurodynamics provides? And most importantly, does every neurological patient require Eurodynamics? So you heard about the non-invasive Eurodynamic tests, and many, most of you would be probably performing these in your, in your, um, in your clinics, uh, where, where the, the patient um, voids into a, a portable commode, uh, with, most often with a spinning disc, and the flow is recorded. And uh, after that, of course, the post void residue is measured either by an in-out catheterization or more commonly by ultrasound. And you have an idea about, the, about whether there's incomplete bladder emptying. Of course, a very useful test to assess the voiding functions. And this is quite relevant in the neurological patient because whereas most of the neurological patients will tell you about urgency and frequency and incontinence, the problems with voiding are often more gradual, more subtle. So a patient with multiple sclerosis might have a progressive MS where they have a degree of voiding difficulties that progresses over time. A patient with Parkinson disease, once again, it's a progressive process. Because it's progressive, there's no acute episode of, say, retention. The patient might not um, share with you symptoms of voiding difficulties. And as a result, this, um, often the voiding test will tell you that it will give you a hint that there's something not right. Now, um, um, this, of course, is the, is the normal parabola, which uh, shaped flow. But um, the, the flow test doesn't tell you why there's a problem with voiding. As you will all know, the problem with voiding can be either because the bladder muscle is not contracting or there's some sort of an obstruction at the outlet. And so uh, if you get a flow like this, it doesn't tell you further what the cause is. But if you do find a flow like this, then of course that warrants further invasive urodynamics to establish why there's a poor flow. Sometimes you might pick up a flow like this, a sawtooth-shaped flow, which uh, would indicate a, um, a, a sphincter muscle that's, um, that's uh, rhythmically contracting and relaxing, as one might see in dyssynergia. Once again, the flow test does not diagnose dyssynergia, but seeing this flow, one might suspect the possibility and of course, only with a video urodynamic study or with a combined EMG with urodynamics would one actually establish a diagnosis. Now, I won't take you through too much to the actual technique of invasive urodynamics. That's probably uh, um, not, there's not enough time to, to, uh, to fill you in on that. But essentially, what you do look at is doing uh, the bladder filling and a pressure flow study. And of interest, especially in the neurological pressure, is what is the intravascular pressure? Is the detrusive pressure rising or not? Is there any involuntary um, uh, uh, contractions, uh, detrusive overactivity? What's the compliance or the stretchability of the bladder? What are the bladder sensations? Are they, are they impaired or is it a hypersensitive bladder? And uh, of course, if there's incontinence, what is, is it associated with overactivity? Um, is it associated with, um, with, with coughing or with, or with making the patient rise? So you understand the cause for the incontinence. And uh, the earlier question about difficulties in voiding can be answered in a pressure flow study, as it will clearly tell you whether there is a high pressure, low flow situation, which would suggest an outflow, or if it's a low pressure, low flow situation, which suggests that the detrusive muscle is not contracting. And as uh, Thomas mentioned, that if rather than saline, if one uses a dye and takes x-rays, one has what's a, a video urodynamic study, which provides additional information and therefore should ideally be performed um, in, um, in, in the neurological patient if the patient requires urodynamics. Um, and uh, will give you an idea about the, the morphology of the bladder, the outline, so if there are sort of lower urinary tract complications such as diverticula and trabeculations. But also it'll tell you if there's a reflux, which happens if the bladder pressure is rise. Um, and also it'll tell you specifically where the site of obstruction is. Now, I, I have left out a slide on EMG and neurodynamics, essentially because it's performed only in very few centers, and for a basic course, probably inappropriate. Uh, 
Um, uh, and at our center, we do perform EMGs for, um, uh, uh, regularly, but not part of urodynamics. And I believe one of the important reasons why people have moved on from a combined urodynamics with uh, uh, EMG uh, is because of video urodynamics, which gives you the answer, what is the cause for the outflow obstruction, and will tell you, will show you if there is dyssynergia or not. Now, there are many, many advantages and importances of, of, of using urodynamics. It certainly tells us about the path of the lower urinary tract dysfunction. So if a patient tells you about urgency, frequency, and continence, uh, and you have an overactive detrusor muscle, uh, or, a, or a poorly compliant bladder, uh, or, or just raised detrusor pressures, and if obviously you have a reason, you have the explanation for the overactive bladder symptoms. If the patient has poor flow, um, uh, it, and, and you pick up that there's dyssynergy, it tells you that there is uh, uh, a, 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 this problem at the outlet, and, uh, and hence that would be the reason for the low flow. Uh, but if you can also very well have an underactive detrusor, so ask what can happen if there's a lesion of the sacral cord or the cauda equina, and a hypocontractile or an acontractile detrusor might be the cause of the poor flow. So urodynamics is essential to understand the lower urinary tract dysfunction that's responsible for the symptoms that a neurological patient reports. Now, um, it also will tell you if, about additional um, um, uh, uro urological pathologies. So we heard about the importance of examining the prostate. So the common scenario is in a middle-aged man with Parkinson's disease, where there is um, a degree of lower urinary tract symptoms and, and a degree of obstruction the video dynamics would be a, a useful tool to establish whether there is indeed uh, outflow obstruction as a result of an obstruction at the level of the, of the prostate gland. Now, the other area where video urodynamics is, is extremely important is, to, is that it tells us about the risk for upper urinary tract damage. We heard about what raised detrusive pressures can do, and as a result of detrusive overactivity or poor compliance or dyssynergia, the pressures rise, what happens when the pressures rise is there is then uh, an increased risk for upper urinary tract complications, so reflux, hydronephrosis, renal impairment, and end-stage disease. And this is quite important to recognize because if you want to now take a step back again, if you look at patients with spinal cord injury as a whole, the commonest cause of death in the early 20th century was not because of a bed sore or because of the spinal cord injury, but in patients who are chronic spinal cord injury who, in, and who, who have been rehabilitated or probably not adequately rehabilitated, the commonest cause of death was actually renal failure. And of course, in, since then, with intermittent self-catheterization and the, and the host of now treatments that you'll be hearing about later in, in other sessions about managing the low, uh, low urinary tract dysfunction, this has come down. But essentially, it's because of the risk for the upper tract damage that you have this problem of, of renal impairment. Um, however... We all know about the, the disadvantage. We know, know about the limitations of urodynamics. Uh, we know that it's not a natural environment uh, with catheters. And so there certainly is a bit of anxiety to perform as a scientist or a nurse or a doctor will command. Um, it's not uh, normal to be peeing with tubes in both uh, orifices down below, which itself can influence a test. Um, and in the other way, that 10% of Individuals who have symptomatic lower urinary tract symptoms may have normal urodynamics, and it is an invasive test. There is always a risk for complications in urinary tract infections, even in the best of hands, and though low, for a patient with a neurological disease who's suffering from so much, from spasticity, from pain, from bladder problems, and then they get a urinary tract infection, and then the neurological uh, uh, situation deteriorates, you then wonder is the test actually going to serve the purpose of, of advancing that patient's care? And, of course, it's the fact about the upper urinary tract damage that we are all concerned about. Now, if you look at the statistics, um, actually, not all neurological diseases are the same. So you have certain conditions, such as spina bifida and traumatic spinal cord injury, for example, where the, the, the risk for upper tract dilatation is the, 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 the prevalence is much higher, and the risk for renal failure as compared to the general population is much higher uh, compared to the general population. Whereas in patients like multiple sclerosis and other progressive neurological conditions, um, the, the, the prevalence of upper tract changes are less. And in fact, in epidemiological studies, 
it's said that the risk for renal failure is similar to the general population. Now, it's not clear why that's, this is the case, but the, the rule of thumb is that in progressive neurological disorders, the risk for upper urinary tract changes in damage and renal impairment is much less compared to static neurological disorders. So your progressive conditions include multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's disease, your hereditary neurological conditions. These conditions will progress slowly. Perhaps it could be because there's time for compensation. It could be because MS affects women more, so the incontinence occurs much earlier on, and therefore the pressures are dissipated. But for reasons we don't fully understand, there's clearly a dichotomy, and there's a difference in risk uh, between certain neurological conditions, and this must be borne in mind when deciding whether urodynamics is appropriate. So at various four, this has been discussed and debated, and there clearly is no clear consensus. However, what has been recognized is this dichotomy, that there are patients with increased risk for upper tract change and uh, patients with lower risk. So, um, and so many of the, uh, 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 the, the, gu the guidelines and algorithms, especially the initial uh, assessment of the neurological patients, have actually left out urodynamics, with, especially in patients who are deemed to have a low risk for upper tract damage. And, uh, and, and, and uh, MS guidelines in the UK, for example, uh, the, the guidance is that these investigations should be carried out only in those who are refractory to conservative treatments, bothered by the symptoms, and wish to undergo further interventions. This is one example of guidelines. Um, you look at sort of the, the, the ICI, so we've just debated this, uh, and, and Apostles presented the, um, the, uh, the guidelines yesterday in the ICI, which will be finalized tomorrow. Uh, but essentially, what was clear is that in the initial management, actually, urodynamics is not required in every patient. And it's really uh, appropriateness of urodynamics. If you feel that um, you're uncertain about the cause for the patient's lower urinary tract dysfunction, if you suspect that there might be concomitant urological pathologies, or if you deem that this patient is at a higher risk for upper urinary tract damage, perhaps they have spinal cord injury or spina bifida, or perhaps they're a patient of long-standing multiple sclerosis in a wheelchair. These are sort of the situations where you, when a patient is deemed to have increased risk, then certainly urodynamics in the initial stage is warranted. However, more and more guidelines are, uh, especially around progressive neurological conditions, would, would not include urodynamics in the initial assessment of those patients. Whereas patients with spinal cord injury or spina bifida, where the risk is much greater, then without doubt, urodynamics is required. So in, um, so in short, the role of the urodynamics in neurological patients, it'll tell you considerably about the lower urinary tract dysfunction, what happens. It tells you about the risk for upper tract damage in that patient. Um, but more and more, in patients with progressive neurological conditions, um, in the initial stage, urodynamics are helpful if the bladder symptoms are unclear, if you, if you require the urodynamics to, to, to define a plan of management, um, or if there's a poor response, or you want to consider further interventions beyond the first-line treatments of these patients, or if you've de deemed that the risk for upper tract damage is greater. Thank you.